The Face and the Vessel, a comparative analysis of facade design strategies within the context of technology and representation. As the title suggests, our presentation today reflects a series of investigations into the role of facade design strategies in present-day architecture. As educators, we feel compelled to seek out a basis for understanding of facade theories in order to establish a productive dialogue with our students and colleagues. As practitioners, we find this course of inquiry a positive influence on our work. At this point, I believe we've identified more questions than answers, but would like to share our observations with you here today. These slides shown here today are the result of a series of discussions within our office and grown, have grown out of a class on facade theory taught at the University of Texas at Arlington. In order to come to a fundamental understanding of facade, we begin with the root definition. The face or identity is seen as a set of variations within a controlled set of norms dictated by the genome. This defines a normative set of expectations one reads in the face when encountering another person. It defines our expectations and sets the course of ensuing action. When those expectations are not met within this known construct, we must develop a new framework of reference in order to understand the disconnect. Like the face, our traditional understanding of facade is understood as a series of variations within a set of normative strategies. These controlled strategies, when encountered within a familiar range, define our expectations and dictates how we experience architecture. Our understanding or reading of facade is connected through history regardless of technology or style. Even though projects may vary greatly, based on our collective understanding of these norms, we may negotiate variations in the experience of architecture. In the book Surface Arch Architecture, Leatherbero Mostafabi outlined two primary ways of understanding building image, the first of which is the project of representation. The building image is developed through concept regardless of the types of construction. The final building image is, primar is the primary concern and may often be at odds with normative construction tectonics. The second of these ideas is the development of building image by the application of the methods of production. The final building image is read as the application of rational tectonics of construction and has its roots in a vernacular way of thinking. It is undeniable that the development of building image throughout history has been influenced by the implementation of available building technology. These early structures represent the concepts of tectonics and stereotomics as outlined by Gottfried Semper and show a direct relationship between construction methodology and building image. The project of representation is absent. The monumental architecture of the Egyptians and Greeks represents a refinement of the technology of the trabeated system. The building image is developed through a direct expression of structure either by reading the wall as mass or by the implication of surface by structure. It is limited by its means of construction. The ancient Greek culture was concerned with notions of beauty, proportion, and order, and thereby developed the first system, systematized project of representation, which was applied as a control to the existing tectonic language. The Romans provide the first major material advancement with the introduction of concrete coupled with fired brick. This allowed for the development of the arcuated system and shows a direct relationship between structure and surface. The Romans also adapted the Greek orders as applied ornamentation. In Thomas Schumacher's The Skull and the Mask, he points out the atectonic contrast between structure and surface, whereby the applied ornamentation of the post and lintel system spans a greater distance than the structural bay of the arch. Building technology, with a few notable exceptions, remains essentially unchanged for the ensuing centuries. One of those exceptions is the Gothic period, which is seen as a refinement of stacked stone technology. During the Renaissance, the rediscovery of ancient technologies and modes of thought brought about a shift from a building image derived from technology of construction to pure representation. The building image is still limited by stacked stone technology and therefore has a limited spatial potential.
The idealized conditions of the Renaissance define our traditional understanding of the facade. In most cases, the examples are embedded in the dense context of urban fabric. Subject to the urban condition, facade development was influenced by continuity of surface and the external pressures of the public realm. It may be read as an applied surface masking the private sign of the internal functions. A stabilization of society allowed for development to occur outside the defensive walls of the city. This condition results in the requirement for multiple faces, giving rise to the celebrated object. At the turn of the 20th century, new technology, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, alters the building image in a significant way for the first time in 500 years. Like the Romans 2,000 years before, simultaneous advancements in the methods of production and the project of representation are combined to create a new model of facade development. These images show the realization of that potential within a single generation of architects. This series of diagrams illustrate the spatial potential of a structural frame. As ornamentation was stripped away in favor of abstraction, internal spatial pressures and the expression of program alter the final building image. The result is a further emphasis on the object and articulation of surface. Preoccupation with the object and the development of the free facade lead towards an exploration concerned with skin, surface. Mass and depth are banded in deference to thinness and flatness. The dramatic shift in building image from the regurgitated styles of the 18th and 19th centuries to a new model of unlimited variations made possible by technological advances forces a change in the conceptual framework with which we understand the built form. A proliferation of the object and the manipulation of form and surface are the new normative conditions. In his book, Towards New Architecture, from 1923, Le Corbusier declares the promise of new technology and proposes that we look outside of architecture for examples of design. He writes the potential of new technologies in building construction that achieve a scale of object in built form, otherwise unknown until the Industrial Revolution. This photomontage compares the relationship of scale between key monumental buildings and the newly constructed ocean liner, Aquitania. The analogy of building to the ocean-going vessel is apt, where it is seen as a type of mobile building. <clears throat> In comparing the ocean-going vessel to a contemporary man-made structures, we can plainly see that Le Corbusier's promise of technology in regards to scale has been fulfilled. In Gottfried Semper's Style in the Technical and Tectonic Arts, Semper proposes that vessels have four primary functions, containing, scooping, filling, and pouring. Beyond the functional aspects of vessels lie the attributes of form and aesthetic, form generated by the use, and aesthetic, oftentimes a decorative art inspired by the history of that use. The analogy may be drawn between the use and performance. Upon closer inspection, the Aquitania, a vessel by all rights, is a container and exhibits properties of form and aesthetics expressed through me methods of production. A cross-section reveals stacked layers of program, double volume spaces, and many of the components we find in buildings. When extended in a vertical fashion, we find a striking similarity to the methods of production that came about shortly after the Industrial Revolution, resulting in the tower. A static vessel of sorts, it also functions as container, has form, and exhibits aesthetics through applied articulation of surface. Along these lines, a scaled comparison of the rear section of the Aquitania bears an interesting similarities to Nouvelle's Torre Agbar and Foster's Swiss Re. The 20th century liberation of facade from structure has manifested itself in new ways in the 21st century. For the first time in history, advancements in technology are influencing the process of construction, conceptualization, and design simultaneously. All new development falls under one digital tool, 
The resulting building image has become unregulated by limitations of constructive ability or lack of technology. New reference are introduced outside the realm of architecture that alter the building image and give rise to the spectacle. The aerodynamic principles regarding coefficients of drag, a function of wind resistance, is documented in Towards New Architecture as a force influencing the design of racing cars. These images of current day jet aircraft, much evolved from the biplanes of Le Corbusier's seminal tome, are still governed by this basic principle. However, with the increase in performance, the tectonic articulation is different, along with the technology of construction, propulsion, and aesthetic. This amplification of forces acting upon the structure have mandated novel conceptualization of both structure and fabrication, many of which have been appropriated for use in building construction. <coughs> These newly conceptualized vessels are placed in the precarious position of addressing the public realm while existing as pure object. Seen as a kind of hybrid of the Renaissance Palazzo and Villa, an urban vessel is required to address the public realm at street level, but then transform the object at the point where scale distorts the reading of the object as a whole. In Simper's writing on the vessel, he provides these diagrams from Jules Ziegler, which represent the basic forms found in ceramic vessels. The language of description includes these terms and phrases, generative forms, primitive forms, mixed forms, crateroids, discoid, and stems. The traditional languages of facade theories are inadequate to address these forms. The current language for architectural vessels is based on the operative tools implemented to create these forms. Perhaps looking to other industries for tectonic models would provide additional insights to a common language for discussion. <clears throat> the most versatile tool to bridge this gap of, of a lack of language be the red tectonic. Paired together with the tectonic and atectonic relationship becomes a means of developing, evaluating, and revising the representational conditions of a project. As Hans Borbein elicits, within the parameters of a given project, the tectonic, atectonic tool becomes a vehicle for aesthetic judgment and serves as a conceptual framework for discussion formally deemed subjective. Seen in this way, the red tectonic may be positioned as an inductive or deductive methodology for establishing the framework for the discussion of the building image. As a variable tool, the red tectonic encompasses constructive and relational aspects simultaneously and has the flexibility to address the idea of building representation in several ways, such as, as an objective means for discussing and evaluating building representation, <clears throat> also as a means to provide an equivalent process for combining the discourse of modes of production and modes of representation, and finally as a way to catalog contextual comparisons between projects of a different time periods, constructive methodologies, and styles. <clears throat> The questions that we ask after making these observations. How can one develop a critical discourse within the context of the varied forces influencing architecture today? Are there alternate sources to provide a framework for discourse? And finally, what is the impact of the object or vessel on the urban condition? This concludes our presentation.